You like playing stupid games, right, Elon? Mm -mm. So you like winning stupid prizes too, right? Mm -mm. Well, let's play one stupid game, Elon. And the name of the game is Platform or Plantation. Mm -mm. True or false? Did you buy Twitter to free your little friends and turn it in to the new grounds for Nazis? Mm -mm. Listen, you little nut rag, you crusty sock. Tell me the truth. Did you swap your white hoods for a blue check mark? Mm -mm. I so sick of you and your flat faces. Next question. Are you purposefully running Twitter into the ground to quell progressive movements and thought leaders right before a general election? Mm -mm. Are you suppressing progressive accounts and amplifying the crypto, mayo, anti-negro brigade? <laughs> and finally, even if all of these answers were true, are we really going to leave this plant? I mean, platform? <laughs> this video is brought to you by my streaming service, Nebula. Now listen here. My relationship with Twitter it ain't complicated. It's literally Stockholm Syndrome. And Twitter is an awful, awful place, and I'm barely there now for that reason. I be kind of giving a side eye when I see white folks retweeting something or liking something. It's like, why are you doing this? It is so... Elon Musk. That, ooh. I... I I hate Elon Musk with a deep fiery passion, son. I hate that man. It has gotten worse since Elon Musk has taken over Twitter. Racial consciousness account, all this in wokeness accounts came on Twitter like a few months ago, 40k followers. Came on Twitter like a year ago, 100k followers. It started off sweet with tweets about my feet. Big rapper. Yes, my feet. Yes, on me. Yes, for free. And at this point, like right now, in the current day of our Lord, 2023. This is like four hard hours away from Stormfront. I ain't gonna lie to you. Despite Twitter or X or whatever you want to call this musky and hellscape of an app, despite it being the online equivalent of I am legend, world building, oh my God, the muscle memory. Oh, how hard it is to make that app wiggle and disappear off my phone for good. And that's because it was once the home of black people Twitter, Caribbean Twitter. Also, the marketplace for... Maps, but let's not talk about that. No matter what it was on Twitter, there was this common thread that tied it all together. And the more that we pull this filigree, the more we see what it all binds together. Or better yet, what it hangs. To access my Twitter, I have to ask my wife for her phone. And then she'll say, why are you trying to tweet? And if it takes too long to explain why I'm trying to tweet, I don't get the phone. It's, it's frustrating, right? Because you know it goes into building a platform, right? Oh, why don't you just leave Twitter? You don't You don't need Twitter. Like, sweetie, you only know me because Twitter. Honestly, I'm at the point where a lot of times I just pretend like the white folks ain't even looking. When I, when I buy like, like tweets blow up and it's just like the f that people will say, it's really out of pocket. It's just like, you would never say this to my face, IRL, like you would. No one, no one keeps the same energy in real life. The legendary icon, Paul Mooney, was definitely in his bag, definitely spitting. When he exclaimed, Everybody wanna be a nigga, but nobody wanna be a nigga. In other words, Unk described, not this Unk, but that Unk described white people's fascination, their obsession with blackness and black entertainment, black people business, and specifically their proclivity toward the consumption and performance of black culture. And the notion that the fantasy of blackness would be much less appealing if white people and now non-black people, who we all know, love to use blackness as social currency. I'm looking at you, K-pop. Like, literally looking at you, dead in the face, looking at you. I'm absolutely looking at you. Actually experience the level of discrimination, racism, and violence, actual violence, that the black diaspora has. It is only until the black community or diaspora sees someone's costume that they call it out. But until then, non-black people can proverbially cloak themselves in coolness using African-American vernacular English and black indicators like long acrylic nails, box braids, and even afros. This is what happens when we give white women attention 
for pretending to be black women. They start to believe it and they start to imitate us. This is very problematic. She wants to be a light-skinned black woman, but not the oppression of a dark-skinned black woman. Lights for the streets, but I'm so much here. I should be playing in the winter snow. But I'm a be under the mistletoe. Tell me I'm not gonna make it, I told him you crazy. My name is how I get one text when they pay me. Baby, you must not know who the f I am. And that's okay, because I'm not asking you to know who the f I am. Baby, you can't act the color. Rachel Dolezal, the NAACP administrator who masqueraded as a whole black woman. Not half, not a quarter, a whole black woman who also married a black man and has black children. Yes, until being massively called out despite having fully white biological parents. I People love to drape themselves in the silk smooth do-rag of niggerdom to seem cool and trendy until they remember that Mima, Abuela, and Almoni think black people are ghetto and never use AAVE in their life. In the wake of social media, scholastic terms like digital blackface have been used to define the use of black gifs, profile pics, and vernacular. Sometimes even going as far to be like racial dollars all by completely pretending and believing that they are black. Twitter, however, is one such medium known for its black user base. Twitter is representative of a of a world. It's it's part of the, the multiverse of social media, right? Like blue check mark, anime PFP, um, ironic sigma male PFP. I mean, I shouldn't even read what you said. <laughs> Shout out to you know. Uh, to a real like I'm minding my business type nigga T1J he did a video on Twitter like a year ago and it was talking about how Twitter is just completely unrepresentative of any type of litmus test of public opinion um Twitter's like for much further left than any other social media platform hmm. don't quote me on this maybe like 20 percent of all Twitter users account for 95 percent of tweets yeah something ridiculous yeah. like that mm -hmm. So it's like, why, why do I care about these motherfuckers? But at the same time, it's like, ooh, keep on talking shit. It's not even the message, it's the medium. It's because Twitter um, explicitly is designed to rip out effective communication elements, to, to rip out nuance, to rip out, rip out context. It's designed to amplify the most... Um, inflammatory elements of human communication and make it worse than it has to be. I'm over it. Like I'm over the need to like, I don't care. They could have Twitter. They could have it. It is, it is a cesspool um, for a number of different reasons. Like it already, like now it is a right wing, just hellhole. You can't say anything without, I've been, been called every kind of slur and thing in the last week is crazy. Like it is, it's a sick app. Like it just is not enjoyable to be, to be, a black presence on that app uh, any, anymore. It just is not. Um, but then you add of what the culture of Twitter already is. Twitter, you you spend a lot of time on Twitter. You become a you just look into criticize you you become your, your your brain the lens with which you look at something it's like where's a whole where can i quote tweet where can i find where it's lacking everybody looking to have the take like to to have the, the contrarian opinion to that or what you didn't think of and that is such a draining negative experience and on top of that it bleeding into real life like people becoming be like people 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 acting like that in real life they don't leave it on twitter that is how they're becoming they are watching things for criticism and i and, and sometimes it's something i have to remind like i have to literally train myself out of doing um because if you spend a lot of time on twitter which i do it will it will bleed and in the press for the muskrats recent purchase it's in current instability issues and now the rebrand to X, whatever the hell that is, which comes with its own set of unique problems and associations, many users are yearning for a more wholesome, less Hitlerian, may I, you know, <laughs> take the luxury of calling it, particle-filled social media platform. Several apps have become promising contenders to fill Twitter's future void. Blue Sky, Treads, Smell, Mastodon. But they're not all flawless, are they? Blue Sky and Macedon both consider themselves as front runners to alternatives to be Twitter. And they're branding for the decentralized federated social networks. The former, in particular, has been lauded as a wonderland for funny posts and just 
good overall vibes, but its most recent moderation policy following a debt threat, yes, a whole debt threat against the block user, has left a sizable chunk of its user base concerned about the safety for marginalized voices and their communities. With a user base of just over 370,000 and over 1.9 million registered on their waitlist, Blue Sky is facing more and more pressure to appropriately handle violence and hate speech. Apps now at the crossroad that could revolutionize and set the tone for how administrators can moderate decentralized social networks. The thing about Twitter and all of these is these platforms make us think they're like ubiquitous, that this is the world we actually exist in. And the reality is it's it's just not. This woman had a whole tantrum on the timeline because I wouldn't join Spoutable. Well, I block. I didn't even hear that one. Some some child that one, that one don't even have an app. That one is a desktop. Is it's like mess. They do not consider what goes into a platform. Like your use of a platform as an anonymous somebody with ten followers and you don't post it, you just follow, consume it. It's not the same way that I have to use it. When you like, oh, join this. And another thing is, it don't. It's work. It's labor to to to, to maintain platform. Like that's what they don't get. That is so much work. And on top of that, you're not enticing me by telling me the app don't have nothing to find there. You're like, oh, you got to get on the app because I need my face on the app. You need me on the app producing content. You need me to come on the app and become a labor in order for you to enjoy it. But you mad at me. You want to kick my back in because you can't understand why I'm not pressed to fucking joy. Like, maybe I don't want to always do social media for labor. Maybe I want to enjoy it too. Ain't nobody there but me. I'm going to be fucking there. So, <laughs> woman, woman, I had a whole tantrum, but I was a fool. <laughs> Because I wouldn't join it's portable. And she tra- and the thing is she ran me so well, I, I wouldn't join our fucking principal now. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so not a whole platform. But before we jump into the problems, I know some of you don't have those fancy schmancy invite codes that they was handing out, you know. And they're probably wondering, you probably wondering how it looks on the inside, you know? You can't hate on the club if you can't get in, right? Before Blue Sky was Blue Sky, it was teased by Twitter's then CEO, Jock Dorsey, who tweeted that the company was funding a small independent team of up to five open source architects, engineers, and designers to develop an open and decentralized standard for social media. Jack Dorsey, the founder of Twitter, is supporting the decentralized social network Blue Sky, which has already attracted 30,000 signups in the past week alone. One, the app doesn't have DMs or the lists feature like Twitter does, but it does allow you to create posts with a 256 character limit, not including media, of course. The Blue Sky tweets, tweets, they literally call it skeet. I, I'm not joking. I'm not, I did not come up for that. They call it skeets. Anyway, in Blue Sky, users can reply, like, and or re posts, or copy them as text using the tree-dot menu. Interesting profiles can be followed and viewed using the usual timeline, while the What's Hot timeline shows the latest, trendiest posts from users around the world, similarly to Twitter's current state. Blue Sky's primary concern wasn't about strong moderation and ethics, But incoming users expected that the social media platform would refuse to tolerate bigotry, even if that diverges from the objective of decentralization. And after an interaction between two users, one black and painfully, crockily racist, God damn it, I couldn't stop it, man. I'm I'm sorry. People really began side-eyeing the platform. And let's put ourselves in someone else's shoes. Walk with me here for a second. Humor me. Indulge. Let me regale you in a story. So you are this amazing block software engineer named Avera. You've personally sent out over 500 invitations to other block folks and publicly recommended the platform to your supporters online as a means of duplicating block Twitter. You have a disagreement with Alice, who owns the Blue Sky accounts, Syrian. Over the multiple racist posts she has made, such as if black people and others do not wish to be some place that reflects the demographics of the Anglosphere, they're welcome to create their own instances. Wouldn't you feel puzzled by such a weird, slightly racist, microaggression-y comment? I know I would. Big body foreign, that's what they call me. Like, they literally call me that. Big body foreign would definitely do that. 
So, my big NBDM woman, them and man, them, let me, let me ask you this question. Now, Aveda isn't a stranger to activism and commentary on and or about social networks. She's known for things like advocating that users stop using R. Kelly's photos, GIFs, and songs, preaches the gospel that black people influence the internet culture and are one of, if not the driving force behind nearly all its trends and vernacular that has widely been since whitewashed as simply Gen Z speak. But we know, I remember the score. I knew who made the sandwiches. I was there, I ate them. Yes, if you didn't realize, Gen Z speak, you know what they talk about Gen Z language, is really just black scent and, and black vernacular English. Let me tell you something, if you ignore the historical context behind many of the colloquial origins, like how long standing the terms have been in use by black people, and especially, must I add, the black queer folk them, especially the trans community, or how white kids just still really don't understand the meaning behind yeah. And again, she's also been vocal about her support for the platform, citing that Mastodon doesn't have a lot of black people on there, which I ain't gonna lie, it does not. And that there was a lot of unchecked racism going on. I, I would not have guessed. But after some more commenters joined the Blue Sky trade, Alice wrote that she should get pushed off of somewhere real high. You figure it out. You use your imagination. Now, imagine that. Two comments. One racist and the other hoping that she gets, you know, unalived, as they say on the clock app. And all because Avita wanted the app to become a more inclusive, welcoming space for all. Then, on July 12th, 2023, something happened. People began mass reporting posts where users added the N-word to their username. Because, you know, Blue Sky had no moderation protocol in place for user handles. Anyone, anybody, literally anybody could hatefully set their name to something inflammatory, bigoted, and or racist. And you know what their response was? It was... A one-off mistake. One Wednesday, users reported an account that had a slur as its handle. This handle was in violation of our community guidelines, and it was our mistake that it allowed to be created in the first place. 40 minutes after it was reported, the account was taken down, and the code that allowed this to occur was patched. In reality, what happened was that the Marsh reports did not matter. What really mattered was the tremendous shift in the way the platform was perceived. It was Twitter adjacent. Much like its feathery counterpart, Blue Sky is also now in the same boat of apps that tolerate racism so long as the black community continues to use it. If there's no penalty after all, what's the point of considering it a real crime? That fluctuation in public perception was actually due to the brilliant actions of podcast host Scott Hurlman. Hope I'm pronouncing your name right. I apologize if I'm not. Who posted a scathing drag of the company on LinkedIn for not having the most basic protection for its users. If you don't want to run a social media platform, split the company in twain and go focus on the protocol and fund the platform with another team that cares. Or... Do you not care about marginalized groups? Anti-blackness in the IT world has been a challenge for decades. Some claim that it's due to the lack of diversity at the top and within the general sphere. But that's obviously because of the level of exclusivity and microaggressions that black people and other marginalized groups have faced in the IT sphere. An article noted that black Americans represent 7% of tech employees in the United States. While Latinos represent a measly 8% and Asian Americans account for 20%. I see that we're still ignoring the indigenous people, so the figures represent a complete and utter disregard for diversity and its inherent value, which is then reflected in the way people of color experience the platforms. The muskrat's tenure at Twitter, for example, has only caused white supremacy to flourish like a bouquet of doodle -doo roses. In fact, a report by Combat Anti-Semitism Movement and the Network Contagion Research Institute confirmed that they viewed his takeover as an opportunity to rejoin the social media platform in mass, especially 
anti-Semitism. CEO Sasha Reutemann Drauder noted that many white supremacists and other extremists have perceived it to be a place where there is permission to incite and even a single tweet from someone like Nick Fuentes or Ye has the power to sow seeds of hate for years to come. It is a very real and tangible threat. When they come for one of us, they will eventually come for all of us. Every time, without fail. They come for you in the morning, they will come for me at night. Which is why class solidarity is so important. But not the only thing that's important. I'm on to y'all. Y'all is always want to talk about class anytime we're talking about race. I definitely do feel like the algorithm can be biased against Pretty you. Much. If you talk about like digital blackface, digital menstruacy, like certain certain topics just like won't get pushed. But you, you talk about like black conservatives, you have all these fucking white people in, in your goddamn comments. I had niggas. I become designated hood nigga and I don't know how I feel. I don't know how I feel about the fact that that's what people are coming to see. Hold on. Go upstairs. I'm recording. Okay, pet the cat one more time. All right, now come on. Upstairs, upstairs. I got on Twitter. I was a Facebook person, partially because I'm an older millennial. So, like, that's that's the joke. We're on Facebook, right? And don't get me wrong. Facebook is really toxic, too. But you have so much more control over your engagement in, like, the greater toxicity of the platform. You literally have to look for it, and you have to allow people to look for you. Versus a normal person, I got to thousand or whatever Facebook friends. And, you know, that's all I need is, is, you know, post a meme, hot take, a joke, you know, fellas, is it okay if a girl did it like all them joints? Like that was fine for me on Facebook. When you get to Twitter, Twitter is so much more driven by spite and antics, you know? Um, And so initially when I had, you know, a few thousand followers, it was fine because, it was very rare that anything I said that was spicy or even controversial to certain audiences would make it out of my Twitter circle. The first time it happened, it was transphobes. The second time it happened, it was transphobes. The first, like, probably half a dozen times it happened, it was transphobes. They're, they're in there. But once, once, you know, I started getting big enough to be a target for racists and for, um, you know, racist adjacent people, uh, I'll say, um, it became clear that, the, especially the way I'm wired, that Twitter was not going to be good for me because I'm the type of person that when you, if you say something stupid with in, in like earshot of me, I'm going to want to respond. Even if it's not fully about me, I'm going to want to respond. And, and then you become a, um, a, a, a cow to milk for these, you know, ne'er-do-wells on Twitter and outside of Twitter where people will purposefully target you or purposefully subtweet or quote tweet or screen grab something you said for the sole purpose of misconstruing it and, and uh, bad faith interpreting it to drive content. And then when you respond, you're not really responding to a good faith interpretation. You're just feeding the machine. Twitter is what put me... That's where they choose. That's what the, 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 the narratives are getting started there. That's where people build their base. That's who they choose and who they want to come appear on the news and the media. Um, no, I can't just leave Twitter. And so that that was um, a frustrating reality at first. Like, oh my God, this everybody's going to you know, jump ship and he's trying to kill this after, which is where so much, not just my platform, but where so many advocates and activists and organizers and people who you wouldn't be able to hear from otherwise or who means the mainstream world would not give a door been able to to get out real information real narratives start movements just do so so much which is precisely the reason the man wanted to take that that's the that's the whole reason for all of this to, to burn it up is the point to make it the right wing cesspool it is is the point and he has proved that in the most transparent of ways at every step and turn and that he is a clown once criticized for its sluggish to ban and penalize white supremacists. The blue op, not, not that blue op, but the blue op is known now as an enabler and a beacon of hate for literal Nazis. Like literal phrenology, measure your head because you is a Negroid Nazi. They ain't even coming with the George Soros and the globalist dog whistles no more. 
They are straight up tweeting about white pride and protecting the white race while murdering, sorry I said the word, murdering marginalized people. I like the alliteration, so, you know, it is what it is. As for treads, let's get on the treads. I got something for you, Zuck, I got, which is delightfully attached to your Instagram and Facebook handles for, for the feds, you know, the feds and the data merchants easy access. It doesn't have the Twitter-esque features of direct messages, spaces, or long video attachments. And remember how Meta easily consolidates your data for you? <laughs> Hold on, let me get some water. Let me get some water. Nah, this, this, this is too much. Let me get some water. Mm. Stay hydrating when you're taking down whole ass platforms made by white supremacists. Um, remember how Meta easily consolidated your data? July 14, 2023, the app is not available to download by EU citizens. Two things about them Europeans, baby. They can make sure they can name a chocolate dessert after black people and they can have a robust legislation. After its major opening day of 10 million registered users in just seven hours, I wonder how they figured that out, users who joined Treads tweeted about how they couldn't delete their accounts without doing so to their Instagram. Y'all need to watch that first episode of Black Mirror's new season, because they literally dramatized this exact situation. The news is, is from Twitter. They, all these news companies, MSNBC, everybody is giving you a list of tweets that are the popular tweets that it takes. Most of the time they do just take the topics, they take the take, we know it's the tweet, but they, you know, they give it to people, they give it to the people that they want actually in the spaces in the news talking about it to take the take and change it the way that they want. So it's all kind of white people that don't take all your tweets and all this is in the next thing and all your, all your narratives. But even when they do, even when they do like show your tweet, they still don't contact these people. They don't let them know and they never invite them on. Like And our, you know, um, the self-righteousness, the ego-driven elements of, of our psyches, the fact that we we know our shit, we fall prey to that, to that medium corruption over and over and over again. And it feeds itself on the frustration that we have in trying to communicate through a medium that purposefully makes communication shitty. You know, that's apart from all the racism, <laughs> right? So we've covered Blue Sky. We've covered Treads. We all know about Twitter's evil ass, but what about Spill? Spill is the newest social media app that is taking the world by storm. It was founded by two former Twitter employees who were fired once Elon took over. They're both people of color, specifically black, and I think one is within the queer community. Twitter's niggified, more bougie, and stylish cousin twice removed on their ma side. Well, many users who were horrified absolutely appalled by the obvious racism of the two major Twitter clones, Blue Sky and Macedon, fled, fleance, flee. They fled to spill, hoping for a utopia. And that's exactly what they got. Similar to Blue Sky, spill is invite only, but it's also black owned and more inclusive. What we thought to be the beacon or the new home for black people Twitter, which is spill. Yeah, I was, oh. Such a, I'm, I was gonna bring that up if you didn't. I'm, I'm happy you are. I, I want to know what you. I want to know what you think about it because, like, it, it's a great example of how even though, like, they purported and they waved the black flag for us to say, "Hey, come on, this is your home," and then I, on, exactly guys. so that we could build exactly. exactly, exactly, exactly. You know, I was thinking about when you said it just now. With the, like, yes, all these black people come on this app and then immediately, you know, you put out the video to know, to like let everybody know it's not just for black people. And you so let me get this straight. The owners of the Spill app knew the app was being promoted and pushed by black Twitter and it was being promoted as the new black Twitter only to now turn around and be like, no, it's for everybody. What's going on, family? My name is Fonz. I am the co-founder and CEO of Spill. On behalf of our entire team, want to welcome you to the Spilliverse. As you're getting settled, we wanted to make sure you know a few things about our guidelines here at Spill. First, we want to make abundantly clear that Spill is open to everyone. Our thesis in building the platform was that if we could build a better experience for the folks who drive the most culture, who also happen to be the same folks that often get the most hate, that it would become a better experience for everyone. As our community guidelines clearly state, we're not here for any abuse, intimidation, hate speech whatsoever from anyone towards anyone else, period. 
Now, here at Spill, of course, we center marginalized groups. We come from marginalized groups. But just because we are here celebrating this amazing, beautiful experience we get the opportunity to have doesn't mean we get to bully others along the way. And in fact, that's like the opposite of the very idea of why we started the platform in the first place. And we all know what happens if we go down that road. And even though I don't want to be very hypercritical of them, to be fair, what you are right in the sense because when I think about it, Blue Sky, a bunch of apps, apps have cultures. Apps have cultures where certain people are more heavily represented on different apps and different, different demographics and they serve that and we know that. And I've never seen a white app or something feel the need to come out and let the rest of us know or us are here too or to, to, to you know what I mean? Like do not want this branding. So I do think, you know, and I don't think it is malicious on their part. I don't think it's probably conscious. I think it's because they live and they've been, they've, they've been, they're in a white world like the rest of us where we're taught that you can't survive on the black, just the black dollar or just the black community. We're always taught to believe that we need, we're not successful unless white people are buying into our stuff too. And that, that, that kind of the mainstream, to be mainstream is to have a white audience. So I, so I understand where the impetus probably came to panic, like, oh, we don't want it to seem like it's only for black people. But it's like, but what's wrong with that? And then there's finally Mastodon, Grandpa, the oldest of all of them with a dedicated user base. All of the Twitter clones, save for one, share racism as its common denominator while simultaneously using black people and their content as fodder to prop itself up as the trendier app. For some reason, tech bros want to make their silly little app and then totally go hands off through the excuse of federated, decentralized social media, which, like they did when Google Glass was announced, they totally thought that was the future. As we've now seen, moderating something decentralized in this way isn't a sustainable framework. Establishing and enforcing community guidelines for all users, irrespective of the settings that they decided to let people toggle, it's what's most important, yet seems antithetical to Blue Sky and Mastodon's aspirations of customization. Mastodon's strategy, for example, is that each server has their own unique set of rules and that one server's policies can't be enforced on another. Being listed under their server picker, which requires being bound to Mastodon's server covenant, which requires active moderation against racism, sexism, homophobia, and transphobia. If you're not on that list, though, you can go wild with what you want. You're bound to minimal moderation. If platforms want the black community, then their goal to have a mythologically vast social network that exists beyond the authority of the platform's administration is optimistic at best and extremely negligent and enabling at worst. They can try to absolve themselves of responsibility, which is most certainly labor-intensive and expensive, but self-moderation permits violence and unfettered bigotry. If you take a step back, though, and review the facts, this whole charade is kind of laughable. I mean, black people and culture are the wheels that keep Twitter turning before anything else. If you don't do the one thing that they've asked repeatedly from moderators on social networks, you know, to keep away hate speech and ban racist, misogynistic, Islamophobic, transphobic freaks, which, you know, you could do, then guess where those same valuable Negroes are going to go? Anywhere but your platform. It's an open secret that the black and queer communities, not that they're mutually exclusive, own social media. Hmm, the cat's out of the bag. I know it might not look that way upon first glance because faces like mine aren't on the US dollar or are the tech billionaires making the rules, or even on your homepage on YouTube. But without black America, the US and the US government is nothing. The same goes for social media. Y'all wouldn't have Yas, Queen, and Slay, and Period if it weren't for black queer people. And yes, for the non-US folks, it's definitely American imperialism. But everyone wants to talk like us, dance like us, dress like us, and bump to our music. The tech conglomerates only deny this fact because they know it's true. And by admitting it, that means that we have the power. People have long noted that white people adopt and enjoy non-white exotified cultures because their own is considered as 
standard. Boring and or non-existent, depending on the country. As I said earlier, performing blackness without the threat of harassment, sexual violence, and murder is absolutely tantalizing. So where the hell do we go from here? Despite the biases, we need to ensure that we continue to build our communities and have solidarity to the point of being able to move to an other when our spaces are threatened and bombarded with racism. Black communities have consistently made white people money and our cultures, verbiage, and traditions are then watered down for commodification. And we face disproportionate barriers that only allow others to get ahead on absolutely zero talent. Whether it be algorithmic failures, artificial intelligence, or in person, the African diaspora continues to endure. The attractiveness of Black Twitter is because us, at our most authentic, is something enviable and also loathsome at the same time. Oppression has shaped our cultures, but that doesn't mean we let our oppressors take what we've made and use it as their own. As in the words of the great Audrey Lord, the master's tools will never destroy the master's house. But you know what will? You. Armed with the theory from videos like these and my colleagues, you can chip away at the fascist facade one person at a time. Just as Shapiro et co. are making propaganda to influence the masses, I'm making propaganda too. But I'm not backed by multi-trillion dollar corporations that want to watch the world burn as they colonize Mars. I'm backed by you. I rely on folks like you supporting independent creators like me, FD Signifier, and Princess Weeks by subscribing to sponsors like my streaming service, Nebula. We've talked about how platforms like Twitter suppress progressives and boost hate groups. While YouTube might not be anywhere near as bad as Twitter, it still has its limitations. That's why we built Nebula, to be the home for independent creators that breach the boundaries of other platforms. So if you like bold deep dives like Second Thought's new F word, then support it. True my link though, you see how that works? With this link, you get a 40% discount off the smartest service in streaming that also now offers bonus access to Nebula classes, where you can learn how to turn data into stories with Simon Glock, which is an excellent follow-up to my class on cultural storytelling, which I really want you to see because I use it to essentially tell a story of one of the darkest times of my life. What you waiting on? Click on the link to support independent creators while supporting your mental at the same damn time. Stop licking them a pretty face. I can see you on Nebula.